You've survived another week. Thank you for listening, downloading, and supporting the Black Man with the Gun Show. Now, last week, kind of went on a tangent to try to tell you and show you that some of the stuff that you hear in the media about the police, about court and how things are done, isn't what you see in video and isn't what should be done. It's how the court system works. I had expert witness and trainer and friend Masada Yu to illustrate that point. I also um, tried to get a few people to understand that a lot of the stuff that we're seeing is inflammatory, negative, doesn't help anybody, especially not us, our community. That you can be disgruntled, you can be angry, that you can be maddened, that you can be saddened by the situation in our country. But the way we've been going about it lately has been wrong. And that's what I meant. Our great country was built on racism. That framework, that situation has been burnt to the ground. But those embers have not gone out. All it takes is an inflammatory word, some pain, some hurt. Somebody to throw just a little piece of lint on the fire, on the embers, on the burnt coal. And it enrages and inflames again. And that is sad. Racism is alive and well, but we can't seem to get past it. I'm not excusing squat. I just want you as adults to make better decisions, to stop the hate and communicate. On this episode, I want to give a little ammo to the Christians who have been persecuted for being pro-gun and give those who are on defense a message. I call it armed Christian apologetics. Michael J. Woodland is going to continue the series of the AR. Again, thanks for being here. Let's do it. This is a weekly podcast for the mature and the cool people in the gun community. The show's title is to inspire, not to incite. My name is Ken Blanchard. I'm a gun rights activist, an author, a trainer, and a professional speaker, showcasing the diversity of the gun culture with experts in hunting, gun rights, the justice system, American history, and self-defense. And it's done all with compassion for all people. Welcome to the show. This portion of the show is sponsored by CrossbreedHolsters.com. Crossbreed Holsters has gained national recognition as a maker of the best and most functional concealment holsters available on the market today. Each holster is handcrafted to ensure your firearm is safe and secure while carrying, combined with the best customer service in the industry. Visit CrossbreedHolsters.com. This week, under the washer and the dryer of the Blanchard Estates, we're going to talk a little armed Christian apologetics. Now, Apologetics is a Greek word for verbal defense, speech and defense. It's a field in Christian theology usually that aims to present historical reason and evidential basis for Christianity and defending it against all objections. As a person of faith, that's where I'm going to go from here. And I'm going to give you some definitions too so that we're on the same sheet. Whether you agree with me or not, I just want you to understand where I'm coming from so that if you choose to agree, you know where you're coming from, too. Now, I know, don't talk about race, religion, and politics. In some places, you can't even talk about sports. But for some odd reason, our country, our culture, our community has been fixated on race, politics, and religion. So, it's the big dog in the room. It's the elephant. It's the 700-pound gorilla that we can't seem to get past. So let's talk about it today. I define myself as a conservative person that's holding on to traditional attitudes and values and cautious about change or innovation, typically in related to politics or religion. You would think anybody that calls himself a Christian would also be conservative, but that's not true. A Christian should be a follower of Jesus Christ a belonger to the party of Christ. The Bible says that good works do not make us acceptable to God. That's interesting, huh? Can't work your way out of it. Can't do good deeds 
You can't live a high moral standard. You can't give money to feed the poor, go to church, serve your neighbors, and still get this thing right. So if you're not a follower of Christ, if you don't do as he would, then you are not a Christian. Kind of like sitting in your garage doesn't make you a car. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Conservative. That means I believe that there's only two types of people, three colors, ten digits, and seven notes, and one life to do the best you can with it all. You get that? Two types of people, three colors, ten digits, seven notes, and one life to do it all. You know the three colors, right? Red, blue, and yellow, also known as the primary colors. And the ten digits, there are only ten digits, zero through nine, but in combination they produce all the numbers that we use in that Roman numeral system. And the seven notes are musical ones, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, in which you can make millions of tunes. There are seven notes in the musical scale, you know, Do, Re, Mi, but the combination of those notes was like what makes music. And the two types of people that I skipped over are those of X and Y chromosomes. And these are the things which I'm just going to start with that I believe so that you know where my stance is. You can believe whatever you want. It's a free world in most places anyway. As a follower of Christ, you know, we're told constantly that we were created with a purpose and if it's true, then you were made to do good works, born to leave a legacy, and the events of your life are directly related to your understanding of this. Mine has been to protect and to serve. Pretty much like you see on police cars, that statement is pretty much my statement for everything I've done in my lifetime. Protect and serve. And I've done that in 13 countries. But when I became a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Somehow, I was in conflict to my calling, according to some people. They were talking about how I didn't trust in God, being a gun person, how I was living by the sword, which was a negative to them, uh, according to their interpretation of the Bible. How eye for an eye was an Old Testament thing that didn't apply that I was not doing as Jesus instructed when he said, love your enemies. And that the part about the battle is not yours from the Old Testament as well, sometimes quoted. Maybe you too, as a person, a follower of Christ, a Christian, a person of faith, have had some issues with uh, non-believers and people who put you on the spot for your faith and for your belief in the right to keep and pair arms to have a gun for self-defense. Have you ever had trouble? Have you ever been questioned or gave the stink eye because you wanted to carry a firearm? It's getting better than it used to be, but it's still there. There are many Christians who accept that reality that the profession of arms means that you can carry arms to be used in combat against enemy soldiers or even against criminals. But some of these same believers disagree with the idea of just regular people carrying firearms because in their minds only the higher powers are to be where the sword and these same powers are ordained by God to provide protection and to punish evil doers complicated matters is the popular image of Jesus Christ presented as a meek and mild mannered man who exhorted his followers to turn the other cheek and to love their enemies Therefore, the right to bear arms for self-defense strikes many believers as foreign to the Bible and just outright unchristian. Yet, there's a very interesting command given by Christ that has escaped the attention not only of many laypersons, but even theologians. And you can find that in the New Testament book of Luke, chapter 22, verses 35 and 36 and 38. Now, in this text, Christ was explaining to the disciples how at one time in their journeys with him, it was unnecessary to carry supplies because through him, all their physical needs are being met. Now, things were going to be different. It would now be necessary for his servants to supply their own physical needs. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, Take it and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. 
The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, he replied. The Greek word for sword is machaira or makaira, meaning fighting weapon. And you can look that up in the concordance of your gospel book. Yeah. Fighting weapon. Some people used to think that it meant uh, fishing utensil. See, most of the disciples were fishermen, so they thought maybe it was just a small little knife. But if you study the Greek word for sword, you'll see it's used throughout, especially in Luke 22, verse 52. This test spotlights the infamous betrayal of Christ by Judas Iscariot in the Garden of Gethsemane with armed officers of the Sanhedrin, where it said, Then Jesus said to the chief priest, the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, I am leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs. The Greek word for that makaira again, or machaira, appears again in this verse for sword, meaning fighting weapon. Undoubtedly, the temple guards carried swords to enforce the law and for self-defense. And if the disciples carried the same kind of swords, logic tells us that the purpose was also for self-defense. To better understand what was happening to Christ during that betrayal, it has to be explained who the arresting officers were and what reasons did they seek to arrest him in the first place. You see, the Sanhedrin was the religious equivalent of the U.S. Supreme Court. The function of our Supreme Court is to safeguard the Constitution through the handing down of rulings and interpretations regarding alleged violations of the, quote, law of the land. So, in the same way, the Sanhedrin was comprised of religious leaders. Sadducees and Pharisees, whose function was to interpret Jewish law and to decide whether anybody had violated it. See, according to them, Christ had violated Jewish law by claiming to be the Son of God. I'm getting out of John 19, verse 7. In their employ were officers, the quote, temple guards, who were empowered to arrest alleged violators of Jewish law. They were actually like bailiffs, officers of the court. And naturally, in their function of making arrests, it was necessary to be armed just as our modern-day law enforcement officers are. You see, temple guards were armed with swords and clubs. Keep in mind that the disciples carried the same kind of swords. Let's go back to the story in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember Simon and Peter in John 18.10, who had a sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. We know his name is Malchus. Now, if you want to dig deep into the scripture right here, you realize that, one, if Jesus, son of, son of the living God, is omniscient, all-knowing, then he knew that Peter was about to do what he was going to do, and he did it as a teaching moment. Secondly, he had to make sure that Peter understood that he was not there for the same thing that Peter thought, that he must go through the sacrifice which was to come, this crucifixion wasn't going to happen in this garden and he basically did not need Simon Peter's help if he needed to call down a legion of angels to protect him he could have he had a mission to do you see the sword was a fighting weapon the weapon of choice among soldiers and civilians alike Christ was concerned about the physical not the spiritual needs of his disciples when he told them to get a purse to carry money and a bag most likely for clothing and possibly food. And then there was a spiritual purpose for the sword, Christ, as the omniscient, all-knowing one. He could have prevented Simon Peter from even using the thing if he wanted to. And why was there a physical purpose for the bag and the purse but not the swords? The disciples carried swords mimicking the practice of godly men in the Old Testament, some of whom were not even soldiers. The real message of Jesus Christ was that because he would be leaving the disciples to be crucified and to return to the Father in heaven, it would be now their responsibility to take care of their own physical needs. And one time there was no need to worry about money, clothing, food, or protection because the Lord had provided it for them all. But now, after this crucifixion, it'll be a new ball game. They're going to be on their own. One of the reasons why many Christians or followers of Christ fail to see the physical purpose for the sword 
is because the word sword is sometimes used metaphorically and not literally. For example, Christ said in Matthew 10, 34, Do not suppose that I come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Because Christ did not mean a literal sword in this text, but actually meant his, that his teachings would cause dissension and division, many Christians assumed that there also had to be a non-literal purpose for carrying swords in that Luke 22 passage that we talked about. So when Peter wounded a soldier and Christ healed him, many Christians have taken this out of context by suggesting that there was only a spiritual purpose for carrying swords. They forgot that more than one disciple carried a sword and that the traditional reason why people carried swords was and is for self-defense. But you probably heard somebody say, but if you need a gun for protection, you're really not trusting in God. Have you heard that yet? Let's look at the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Did not Nehemiah have faith in God, yet told his men to remember God and to arm themselves to protect their families? Check out Nehemiah 4, 9. But we prayed to our God, and because of them, we set a guard against them day and night. Verse 17 of Nehemiah 4. Those who were rebuilding their wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other building holding a weapon. As for the builders, each wore his sword girded at his side as he built, while the trumpeter stood near me. Nehemiah 4. Check it out when you get a chance. Isn't it true that even the anti-gun folks locked their doors at night if they really trusted God? That he's not going to allow them to be harmed by a criminal, then why is there a need to lock the door? Why does there need to fasten your seatbelt in the car? If they respond that certain common sense human precautions must also be taken in addition to prayer, we can point back to Nehemiah as a man of faith that's saying that arm yourself. This is common sense human precaution. Locking your doors, fastening your seatbelts presupposes that something might happen. If we maintain that false sense of security, then God is always going to protect us even when we avoid taking the necessary precautions we're wrong if you're not a person who has the bible has read it in a, in a while some of the stuff that I'm saying might be a little off to you but make note of it and when you get a chance go check it out for yourself see if I missed a word or threw some extra crap in here how about when people say he who lives by the sword will die by the sword, as is stated in Matthew 26, verse 52. See, what actually happened is Peter illegally assaulted the officers at the Sanhedrin who were simply doing their ordained job, namely to arrest violators of the law. You can get that out of Romans 13, 1 through 7 as well. Though Peter sincerely believed he was protecting the Lord, ignorance is not an excusable defense when you commit an act of violence. Had the disciple killed one of the officers, he could have been killed himself on the spot by another officer. Or he would have been arrested, tried, found guilty of murder, and then sentenced to execution by crucifixion. He became the aggressor when he was unlawfully um, attacking Malchus. So consider this modern example. You yourself are licensed to carry a firearm, and you're strolling with your friend who, wanted, who was wanted by the police. A police car pulls up and two officers disembark and attempt to arrest your friend. Out of love and loyalty for your friend, you draw your handgun and fire at the police. Isn't that illegal? Isn't it possible that you could be killed by one of the officers? Wouldn't you be arrested for the criminal misuse of a firearm? Either for attempted a murder of a police officer or murder itself if one of the officers is killed. So if that's true, isn't it the same as what happened there? And that's what happened to Peter. He and the other disciples were authorized by Christ to carry swords against robbers and murderers, but not to misuse the sword by attacking agents of the higher powers in the performance of their duties. The message of Christ was a simple one. Any person who lives a lifestyle of violence by criminally misusing a weapon will most likely die by violent means. If Christ never intended for the disciples to use swords for self-defense, Either he would have not authorized them to carry them for fighting weapons in the first place, or he would have made it clear to them they were forbidden to do it. Peter also messed up when he failed to see that God had a purpose to be arrested, tried, and crucified in order to bring salvation and forgiveness to the world. And because the disciple inadvertently attempted to thwart God's plan of salvation, he got slammed by Christ. 
That's the conversation that you hear. That's in context. Oh, how about the ones who say, but didn't Christ teach us to turn the other cheek? Like out of Matthew 5, 38 and 39. And it's like a requote from an Old Testament saying about, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Remember that? Yeah, eye for an eye. You see, in the Old Testament, under the law of Moses, any individual who caused a serious injury to another could be brought before an arbitrator who could then decide to mete out the same injury to the guilty party as punishment. And this was the injured party's right to take it to court and exact retribution. But Christ was not introducing a new law or ethic that an injured Christian was no longer allowed to exact retribution. Keep in mind that the Old Testament practice of an eye for an eye from like Exodus 21 occurred after the fact in court wherein a determination was made as the guilt or innocence of the accused offender. Nowhere here do we see any prohibition against the spontaneous use of deadly force against somebody attempting to take an innocent person's life. The new turn the other cheek doctrine was in essence teaching Christians not to seek revenge for an injury or an offense at the hands of a foe. It taught restraint. Moreover, a slap to the face has been universally accepted in all cultures as an assault on one's pride, not a threat to one's life. Does anybody really think that turning the other cheek means that a devout Christian woman must submit to a rapist? No one in their right mind would answer positive to that. And what if the woman decided to defend herself by grabbing a frying pan to bash the mess out of that dude's head? Would they consider her a bad Christian? Does anybody really believe that a good Christian should allow himself or herself or a loved one to be maimed or killed by a criminal? Is there any biblical evidence that God's people allowed themselves because they were morally obliged to, to be killed by evildoers without resistance? So Christ's message was simple. He said, when you're harassed, insulted, or even persecuted, you're not to retaliate in kind. And this brings about a good point that I want to throw right in here, free of charge. When you are carrying a firearm, it is for your self-defense. When you fear your life is in jeopardy, when you are saving the life of yourself or somebody in your presence. It does not mean that somebody who curses at you, spits at you, um, slaps at you, deserves to die or be shot. There is some common sense stuff that maybe folks have forgotten about. It's lethal force and there are rules for lethal force. Don't confuse and make the firearm, the machine, the tool a god, a talisman to ward off evil. That having it means that you won't be in trouble. Means that you won't piss somebody off. Means that having it is going to make things all right. You can have it and never let anybody know you have it. Only bring that bad boy out if your life is in danger. There might be many cases where you witness something that doesn't require you to even acknowledge that you have a firearm. You don't have to be the Superman or the Wonder Woman in the group. Some stuff, you need to just walk away. Turn the other cheek. Deadly or lethal force is that degree of force that a reasonable person would consider capable of causing death or grave bodily harm. And those of us who carry a concealed handgun carry with us the power to use deadly force. And this is tremendous power. And sometimes you need a little bit more maturity than I hear and see. Good judgment includes always effectively concealing your firearm and retaining it. It entails properly securing your firearm at all times so that your weapon does not fall into unauthorized hands. Good judgment means avoiding situations that you know beforehand could turn ugly. It means you never provoke a confrontation when you're armed and you leave the scene of a potentially escalating confrontation if you can. Appropriate restraint means exercising appropriate self-control and self-discipline in confrontational situations because you are armed and you carry the power to use deadly force. It means using your head and not overacting. As civilians, and I mean not law enforcement, our only obligation and right is to keep ourselves and our families from being unlawfully injured or killed. We may only use equal force in response to the application of force against us. 
if we are not innocent of provoking a confrontation or we are not being immediately threatened with deadly force, we cannot use deadly force in response. You got me? And this is unlike the obligation of a sworn police officer who may use necessary force to fulfill his or her duties, such as seeking out and arresting the bad guy or to control a situation. Which brings me back to that piece in the Bible that says in Matthew 5, 43 and 44, to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In context, it means that self-defense is only allowable when faced with a life-threatening situation. Only murder, the unjustified killing of an innocent human being, is evil. It also means that men and women of God are not morally required to show love through pacifism to anyone determined to inflict serious bodily harm on them. And four, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, to live at peace with everybody, according to Romans 12, 18. The Apostle Paul, who wrote the letter to the Romans, realized that it was not always possible to live peacefully with everybody. Though the Christian was to do everything in his power, or her power, to avoid that conflict, Nowhere in that text do we see the self-defense being forbidden. Paul never expected a believer to live in peace with a violent criminal because it's impossible. And lastly, Christ taught his disciples to love their enemies. And he also instructed them to carry swords, which have been replaced by handguns today. In my show notes, I'm going to leave the scriptures, try 90% of them that I quoted, so you can read them for yourselves. I'm going to ask that you would pray for me, for our nation, for your community, and for your family, for the safety of all. Pray for understanding and compassion. Pray to temper yourself. Be a little tougher, especially when there is so many things that make us want to just flare up. This portion of the show is brought to you by the United States Concealed Carry Association. The USCCA has been providing education, training, and self-defense insurance to responsibly armed Americans since 2003. Join Tim Schmidt and myself here at usconcealedcarry.com. All right, next up, Michael J. Williams is going to talk about what you do after you zero that rifle. Michael's been doing a series for me on the AR-15, and you guys have liked it so far. So take a listen. And Mike, you're up next, brother. Thank you, Ken, and welcome to another Tips and Review segment. I am Michael Woodland of m-wtactical.com, and today we're going to discuss what to do after you get your zero completed. For the past couple of weeks, We have been discussing the AR-15 or M4 rifle. Just like any other firearm, you can get personal with it, but training is the essential key. If you want to get good, you have to practice. There are various training options you can do with this firearm. Since you have a multitude of training factors that are presented to you, what would be your poison for throwing rounds downrange? Are you one that just likes to plink at said distance with your friends? Are you one who tries to perfect the military qualification standard? Or are you the one who taps into your inner John Wick? Regardless of what type of shooting you prefer with your AR-15 or M4 rifle, there is a spot you can shoot in your community. Many shooting clubs host three-gun shooting, but if that is not your lane, there is a competition match called two-gun where you can use your handgun and the AR-15 or M4 rifle. Yes, I never competed in a two-gun match, but seen it online in the state of North Carolina. From what I gather, it could be fun. There's always some NRA shooting competitions that will allow you to shoot your AR-15 or M4 rifle. Again, just do a look up online and get involved with the shooting activity in your community. You will meet a good group of people who like to do the same thing you like, throwing rounds downrange. For now... I'm about to go to the gun store and hold what will be my next AR-15 or M4 rifle. Until next week, keep the trigger pull level and your sight picture steady. If you haven't done so, 
get on M-W Tactical Facebook page and hit the like button and share your firearm thoughts with us. If you'd like to stay in touch with the information we put out on Twitter, follow us at M underscore W Tactical. If you want to see the pictures of our ventures on and off the range, follow us on Instagram at Munitions Weapons Tactical. If you would like to read more about us and see what and where we will be next, visit www.m-wtactical.com and stay informed. If you want to ask a question or just send us a note, you can either by calling 803-250-1256, leave a message, and we will return your call. Or just email us at info at m wtactical Dot com. Until next week, keep shooting, keep practicing, and have fun. Back to you, Ken. Thanks, man. And now, something completely different. I'm Ken Blanchard, and I want to invite all those in the Maryland, D.C., and Virginia area that aren't a part of a fun gun club to join mine. It's called the Fun Gun Club. Yeah, that's what it means. It's real. It's going to be something where you can have monthly training. Don't have your HQL yet? Don't know what that is? You'll find out here. Can get concealed carry? Able to get it? We'll work on that one here, too. Got a gun? Never shot that bad boy. We'll bring it out the mothballs. Training. Fun. There's a lot of things that you can do outside of a static gun range. Did you know that the F in firearms can be for fun? Yeah, we're going to do it here. Be a part of a new thing that I'm starting, and it's going to be a blast. The Fun Gun Club. If you're interested, email me at blackmanwithagun at gmail.com. It's for the Maryland, D.C., and Virginia people right now it's not for everyone though if you qualify contact me blackmanwithagun at gmail.com the fun gun club Fun Gun Social Club has begun, and we had a little meetup the other day, and uh, we got one other one planned for July, as well as a schedule and a calendar and a website, a private Facebook page, and I'm setting up trainers for a monthly training and build an AR and a whole bunch of individual stuff, whatever the folks that I have in here want, like we're doing a family training session, we're going to be doing uh, some gun show stuff, and it's going to be members only kind of thing. Just the cool people that wanted to hang with your friend and your brother in the Maryland, D.C. and Virginia area. Remember, if you're interested, contact me by email at blackmailthegun at gmail.com and I'll give you the details. Otherwise, you won't hear anything else about it. One of the things I want to let you know that remember that the basics, especially safety, never go out of style. The basics. The basis of buying a handgun, the basis of shooting, marksmanship training, the basics are still what they are. They're the base. They're the support system. You got to have them. Even though we've got like fancy guns now, we've got a lot of stuff that's just so high tech. Don't anybody sway you to think that a revolver or 1911 is passe. The revolver is the simplest of all handguns. The variety of revolvers makes choosing one that's best suited for you easy. The revolver, just as the name implies, is a mechanically um, revolving cylinder that brings fresh cartridges up in place in front of the firing pin and behind the barrel. The cylinder holds either five or six cartridges, depending on the model of the firearm. And each time a trigger is pulled, a bullet is fired and the cylinder rotates the expended cartridge down out the way and a new one up for the next shot. The only thing that can go wrong 
is that the, one of the cartridges may not fire when the trigger is pulled. And this can happen, but it's rare. And if it happens, the trigger is just pull it again, and the cartridge that misfired is rotated out of the way. A new one takes its place, and the trigger is pulled again. There are no safety levers to switch on or off, relatively little chance of the revolvers failing to shoot, and never any question whether the gun is loaded or unloaded. You can see the bullets in the cylinder. And if you follow the basics, you realize that all guns are always loaded. Early revolver designs and still some special hunting and target revolvers are what, is, are what are called single action. And in a single action revolver, the hammer, which contains the firing pin or hits the firing pin, must be pulled back and cocked manually. When the hammer is cocked back, the slightest pressure on the trigger releases it to fall and fire the cartridge. Because a single action revolver requires only a slight press on the trigger, it is often fired unintentionally. And that might be some of the reason why that recent NRA thing about their guard, not allowing revolvers to be used. But I disagree with that. The modern revolver is the same as the original design in almost every aspect, except that now the firing mechanism has been improved to a double action. So when the trigger is pulled, the hammer travels from its down position all the way back to the cock position, where it falls and fires the cartridge. Double action revolvers can also be used in the old single-action way, but that's not really smart. In fact, many police departments that issue revolvers back in the day to their officers disabled the single actions of their officers were forced to use the double-action trigger pull. The safety advantage of a double-action trigger is easily understood when you know what it takes to fire it, like 12 pounds of pressure to pull a trigger a distance of more than one inch to fire a cartridge with a double action and less than one pound of pressure to pull the trigger less than one quarter of an inch to drop the hammer when it's locked back in that single action condition. If you have a revolver, make it a rule never to fire it or practice it with a single cocked back hammer action. If you don't get accustomed to locking that hammer back manually, you won't even think about doing it after a while. But it doesn't seem necessary to disable the gun and prevent yourself from ever using that single action mode of fire if you wanted to in an emergency piece. A good compromise I have seen is having that thumb cocking spur, that flat thumb plate on the top of the hammer removed so that it isn't easy to thumb cock the hammer and hair load the trigger. A lot of self-defense revolvers don't have it exposed for that and keeping it from being snagged in your clothes. One of the advantages of having a revolver as a personal defense weapon is that it's dependable, it's easy to use, it's easy for you to tell if it's loaded, easy too for your assailant to see the the gun is loaded. It's easy to be safe and diverse, to be versatile. The disadvantages are few, but they are thought to be significant enough for many who are turning to the more streamlined, high-tech auto-loading pistols. The greatest disadvantage to a revolver, and one that outweighs any other by a large margin, is that the revolver has a maximum of only six shots. After that, each hole in the cylinder must be emptied and then filled with another six fresh cartridges before it's ready to be fired again. Now, anti-revolver people always cite that drawback up to the wheel gun. They say that, although the revolver is relatively failure-proof. When it does jam or have a mechanical malfunction, it is virtually impossible to fix without a tool and usually requires a tool and a workbench. But the autoloader may malfunction with somewhat more frequency, but it can be cleared on the spot and fired or ready to be fired within seconds comparatively. And they add, unless somebody makes a hobby of practicing, the revolver is slow to shoot and less accurate than the autoloader. But I don't believe that. I've been trained in both. And I'm going to make sure that everybody in my group and my circle gets trained in them as well. You might decide that you like it and then to hell with the rest of the people. And the same goes for the 1911 style firearms. But we'll get to that soon. Well, that's it for this week. And I want to make sure that you remember that you are an important part of my life. Thank you for being there for me. And uh, thanks, Michael, for, for doing your thing, man. I really appreciate you being here. And if you like what Michael is doing, please give him a shout out on his website at m-wtactical.com where you can find him on Facebook or Instagram as he stated. 
I got some gun reviews coming the month of July and um, even some new features. So stick around. Come on back. Tell somebody about the show. If there's something I said that you didn't agree with, please let me know. Remember this. Those who judge will never understand. And those who understand will never judge. This is your friend and brother, Ken Blanchard. And just in case nobody has told you this today, I love you. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Until next week. Shalom, baby. Shepherds we shall be for thee, my Lord for thee. Power hath descended forth from thy hand, our feet may swiftly carry out thy commands. So we shall flow a river forth to thee, and teeming with souls shall it ever be. In nomine Patri, et Fili, Spiritus Sancti. <laughs>